Hi there, my name is Isabel Tombleson. I'm a clinical psychologist and a board approved supervisor here in Australia. This video is providing some advice for psychology students who may be moving into the master's program, who are in the master's program or who have already finished their master's programs and are looking at moving into the workforce. I'm going to be covering some topics such as how to make the most out of your connections and networking through your uh, programs of study, how to find job opportunities and some uh, tips and some advice on what's helped me in finding work after finishing my studies. And we're going to also talk about some of the normal experiences that new psychs have when they're moving into the workforce and some of the uh, helpful advice and strategies that can help students when they're experiencing those things. So first of all, let's talk about how to make the most of your connections and networks uh, as you're moving through your programs of study. So this could be through the Bachelor of Honours and of course moving into the Master's programs. So something that I really want to emphasise with all students as they're in their Master's programs is to, I guess, make the most of the people that you meet when you're studying and when you're in, in those situations because you will be not only um, meeting some excellent lecturers and researchers through your university, some wonderful peers that you'll be studying alongside, but also you'll have the opportunity to meet, meet and make connections with people in the psychology workforce. So doing a clinical master's program, for example, you will be required to undertake I think at least four placement um, placements. Sorry. So um, in those placements, you will have a supervisor who will be working very closely alongside you, and of course, you'll have the opportunity to meet peers and work alongside other psychologists and allied health workers, and possibly uh, other health workers um, in those roles. And what an opportunity to um, be able to. First of all, learn what it's like to be on the ground, uh, to be in the role of a psychologist in those settings, but also to be able to learn and grow through observing and making good professional relationships with those people that you come across. So I really want to encourage you to think about making the most of those opportunities. Having some awareness that we are going to, that you will meet people who will have different ideas, different values, maybe some different biases and align with various different treatment modalities that um, you may not have had exposure to before. Sometimes we will really enjoy and be excited by the people that we meet and those um, values um, professional behaviours, treatment modalities that they use and it will inspire us to want to take on and learn from them. Sometimes we will come across supervisors or um, peers, co uh, colleagues that will meet through that journey while we're on placement and we may not particularly agree with where they align themselves with how they provide professional treatment with the treatment modalities that they use. But I want to emphasise how important it is that we are all as I'm speaking, we as in psychologists are all slightly different um, in, you know, our values, biases and um, alignments with certain treatment modalities. Because when you think about it, all of our clients are also very diverse, come from many different backgrounds, varied backgrounds, life experiences, beliefs, ideas. And so it's really valuable for us as psychologists to also be diverse so that we have the opportunity to support people who we come to meet in our practices and that we can all each be slightly different so that possibly, hopefully, the, client, the clients that will work well with us find us. So that's talking about making the most of the opportunities that you have to network while you're in the process of studying, but also just emphasising that it's okay as well if you find that you don't always find people that you align well with, but being able to be professional and have that respect and understanding that it's good that we're different and that we're not all exactly the same. The other reason why I mention this is because when we're, think when we're in our master's programs, 
we're already starting to think, well, where am I going to be working when I finish this? I've just studied for a minimum of six years full time. What am I going to do? This is where the opportunity can come to find uh, work following your study. So the supervisors that we meet while on placement may be able to give us work opportunities while we're still studying our masters. We might be able to work casually for them on weekends or on other days when we're not required to be at university. And from there as well, um, our supervisors or, or colleagues that we meet while on placement might be able to tell us of opportunities in those workplaces or other workplaces that they think that we might be a good fit for. Additionally, those supervisors and colleagues that we come in contact with can give us advice on preparing for interviews, what to expect if we were to interview in a workplace like theirs. In addition, getting to know the systems in those, uh, in those workplace settings so that when you do go to interviews, you might have an advantage if you understand already, say for example, some of the government health systems that are used uh, if you were to ever go for a government health job. So they're just a couple of the reasons, a couple of the ways that you can um, really take advantage of, of those networking opportunities to help prepare you and lay the foundation for some uh, opportunities once you've finished studying. So the next topic we're going to talk about is actually getting work and where can you work when you've finished your master's in psychology, in clinical psychology specifically. Um, I'm going to speak about that because that's, that is what I have trained in and that's where I focus my career. So there are three general um, areas of work that you can go into when you've finished your master's program. Um, bearing in mind that um, it is ideal for you to have, your, uh, to have transitioned from provisional to registered psychologist, you know, um, when you're applying for your jobs, but you can still apply for jobs while you're still a, a provisional psychologist. So, because sometimes there can be a delay with APRA, uh, processing all of those applications at once from the eager psychology students moving into the workforce. So I do want to encourage you to still apply, even if you're still waiting for that uh, psychology registration to come through. But yeah, so there's three main areas. So you could apply for a government health job. So very popular um, to apply for jobs with New South Wales Health in any of the hospital networks across New South Wales. And you would be looking at opportunities for both clinical psychology and psychology roles. There are also sometimes roles in New South Wales Health called mental health clinician roles where psychologists uh, fall into the category of um, pro allied health professional that they're looking for in those roles. The benefit of um, applying for a job in New South Wales Health is if you are a clinical master's graduated student, even if you don't have your clinical master's endorsement and you apply for a clinical psychology job, you are actually paid the award of the clinical psychologist. So it can be quite desirable if you can manage to find a role in, as a clinical psychologist in a New South Wales Health facility, because you would then have the opportunity to be paid at that level probably a little bit earlier than you might be able to achieve otherwise. Naturally, those positions are quite competitive. And so it can be quite rare for a master's student to find themselves a clinical psychology place straight out of master's, but it doesn't hurt to try. And part of the advice I'm gonna share with you today in terms of finding a role is, uh, is to reach out and talk to as many people as you can who are recruiting for those roles. So other roles that you can apply for or other places where you can find work include um, other organisations such as NGOs, non-government organisations. So often it will be a local foundation or a charity who has gone out for tender um, for a program with the government. So the government funds that program, but it's run by a private organisation or a non-government organisation. And there are many organisations across New South Wales and Australia who are running programs. So one really easy example is Headspace. Uh, Headspace across New South Wales is run by many different non-government organisations. 
Another place or another area that you consider working, which is probably quite obvious, is working in private practice. So private practice is a natural progression uh, for master, clinical master's students. Um, master's provides us with the knowledge and some basic skills in being able to provide uh, the fundamental uh, treatment models such as CBT. And, and we could, and you can go straight into private practice once you've finished your master's. There are some pros and cons to this, of course. And I remember some really great advice that was given to me by one of my first supervisors on placement. I'll give him a shout out, Mike McDonald. So Mike gave me really excellent advice and he said to me, Isabel, go and get a full-time job anywhere that you can. And it can be as tough as anything. Don't be afraid. Find the job that's going to push you to your limit and that's going to challenge you. It will be the best experience that you can get as a new grad psychologist. So this is why I'm talking about private practice being slightly, um, you know, a different um, path that you could take in that you can very much be in control of the clients that you get, of the, the practice that you work and the hours that you work. So if those things are going to be of benefit to you, then I highly recommend it. Uh, some of the pitfalls can be that it could be slightly isolating and, uh, and as well, you may not have much exposure to working with other allied health or psychology clinicians. And so therefore potential for growth and development in your uh, psychology skills in your toolbox, you know, it might be slightly slower. Now, I can only speak from the perspective of myself, which is where I went into a full-time NGO job when I finished my master's. So, you know, there might be some psychology students who went straight into private practice after their master's and they might be able to add um, some information. And if you, if anyone has any feedback or positive or otherwise experiences about working in private practice after their master's, please um, pop them in the comments of this video. So I wanted to just touch on um, uh, one thing regarding uh, applying for jobs and just interview strategies that I found really helpful. I was really fortunate to run into a very nice person. They weren't a psychologist, but they worked for Health, New South Wales Health, when I was a new grad from my master's. And they told me um, when I'm in an interview to think of the acronym STAR. So S stands for situation, T stands for the task, A stands for the action, what I did, and R stands for the response or the outcome uh, of what I did. So when you're in an interview or even when you're writing application responses, um, written application responses, you always want to think about providing specific examples of where you have demonstrated the skill that that person is asking you to, to talk about. So for example, if you're asked to provide an example of when you have provided cognitive behavior therapy to a client, you wanna tell them the story of one of the clients that you had while you're on placement that you provided cognitive behavior therapy to. What was the situation? What was your task? What were you required to do? What did you do and what was the, the outcome, what was the response? And that will just enrich your response questions in interviews and also provide an example to interviewers uh, of you know a little bit about your personality, who you are, and what uh, give them a picture of what it's like to work alongside you in a practice. We'll move on now to uh, talking about some of the really normal experiences that students, that new grads, sorry, can experience when they're moving into the workforce. So this is a topic that your university lecturers may have already raised with you, and that's um, the normal experience of, experience of of anxiety, of imposter syndrome, possibly even social anxiety. And look, it, there could be a multitude of experiences that each individual uh, uh, new grad has when they move into a workplace. This can happen both while you're on placement as well, when you're in your master's program. So, um, so let's kind of think that this could apply to both situations when you're on placement and when you've finished your master's and you're moving into the workforce. 
So the reason why I want to talk about this today, and I'll just talk about it briefly, is first of all to reassure you that if you are experiencing some level of distress or anxiety or whatever it might be as you're moving into the workforce, that it is really normal. Master's programs are fantastic because they do give us exposure to what it's like to, to work and function as a psychologist, but it's just the very beginning. And when we move into the workforce and all of a sudden we are responsible, we are these psychologists who, have, who are equipped with this training and there is an expectation from our co-workers, our colleagues and our managers, our supervisors, that we're able to perform a certain job. And that can feel immensely stressful and can feel like a huge pressure on our shoulders. And so if someone, you know, wasn't experiencing these feelings when they were moving from being in a master's into a work workplace, I'd be really shocked because, yeah, this is a normal adjustment to go through. So the reason why I'm talking about it is first to normalize it, but then also to know what do I do with it? How do I deal with feeling like this? The first thing that I want to encourage you to do is to talk to your supervisor about it. Hopefully in your workplace, you will have the support of a psychologist supervisor. Ideally, if you want to become endorsed as a clinical psychologist, you will have a supervisor who is going to put you onto a registrar program for that. So talk to your supervisor about it. Or even if you don't have someone directly in your workplace that you feel comfortable to reach out to, see if there are other peers or former supervisors or even possibly some former uh, lecturers in your uni that you feel comfortable to reach out to and let them know I'm really struggling and just that process of being able to talk about it get it off your chest it will be normalized and you will have some reassurance there that with time and practice that will subside so in essence, what we're doing is we're encouraging ourselves to practice what we preach to our clients. We say to our clients who are experiencing anxiety, it's really important to approach the thing that makes us anxious. And so we want to do that ourselves as well. So I remember when I was um, first, uh, my first role that I was employed in after I finished my master's, I was so nervous and I would drive to work every day. And I, I would say to myself, Isabel, all you need to do is turn up today. That's it. If you just turn up, you have won. Because once you're there, everything will just fall into place. Yes, it will feel very, very anxiety provoking. You will sometimes not know what you're doing. You will sometimes not know how to respond. But if you just turn up today, then you've won. And I did that and I did it over and over and over again until one day I started going to work and I was like, oh, I didn't, I noticed that I'm not really having to say that to myself anymore. I'm just able to go. And all of a sudden you start to enjoy aspects of what you're doing. And yes, there are always going to be challenges. We're going to have clients that will, um, that will challenge us. We might have coworkers or managers who will challenge us. The important thing is to continue to practice what we preach. What would we say to our clients if they were, you know, presenting us with, this, with similar issues. We want to encourage ourselves to keep moving forward. Now, in saying that, we should also talk about, and this will be the last thing we speak about today in this video, which is burnout. So burnout is possibly, hopefully something that you've provided, you've been provided some information on through your course of study. Burnout is something that we really want to avoid as a health workers, as clinicians. Um, we want to be able to pick up on the signs of burnout before burnout occurs. It's much easier to address burnout before it happens than afterwards. So what is burnout? I guess it could be a different experience for everyone because we all may have different tolerances for what we can manage and what we can't. But burnout would be um, showing up for you if you were experiencing compassion fatigue for your clients so that, you know, meaning that we're lacking empathy, lacking compassion um, for clients that we would normally have. Um, if we were taking uh, more sick days than, us than usual or taking more days off, that could be a sign that we're in burnout. Um, if we're experiencing difficulty in our own functioning, so if we're noticing that there's changes in our sleep that are enduring, um, changes in our appetite, our weight, all of the signs and symptoms that we would essentially assess for in our own clients if they were experiencing a hard time with anxiety or depression. 
So burnout's very similar. Compassion fatigue is one of the big signs that we want to look out for. And it's obviously something that we really want to avoid as psychologists because compassion and empathy are the, at the core of what we do. So looking out for the signs of burnout early, noticing if your drive to work is feeling really hard um, or your, your tra travel to work is feeling like a bit of a, a, a hard slog and you're just not quite feeling energetic or excited about going to work for a few days and that that's conti a continuing pattern. If you're noticing that you are taking a few more days off than normal, um, you know, uh, feeling sick or taking mental health days, that's very important and I really encourage that. But if you're noticing that that's happening more than usual, or if you're noticing that, you know, there is a change in how you're feeling generally day to day, um, then that those would be some signs that possibly burnout is on the cards for you. So what to do if you're noticing these signs? As I mentioned before, it's really important to reach out to a person that you feel supported by to talk to about it. So hopefully that would be your supervisor, a manager, co-workers or colleagues, uh, peers um, that you have formed close professional relationships with that you feel open to speak with. And then one really valuable resource that I want to encourage everyone to find out about is who your, um, your uh, organisation's Employee Assistant Pro Assistance Program is run through. So EAP, Employee Assistance Programs, are offered, I think, pretty much in every workplace these days. And you can have, I think, between three and five free sessions with a psychologist through EAP that are completely confidential. So your employer will never know that you've accessed the service unless you want to tell them, which I encourage if you feel open enough to do that. Um, and the, obviously the counsellor, the psychologist that you talk to has to keep your private information confidential. And again, we know that the only time that that would break confidentiality is if there were any concerns about risk of harm to yourself or others. So EAPs are fantastic and I'm very happy to put my hand up and say that I have utilised EAPs when I've been experiencing anxiety as I transitioned into my role as a psychologist, um, as a new grad. It's really normal to experience. So make use of that resource and of course make use of the people that you've developed those professional networking relationship, uh, relationships with through your course of study and as you move into the workforce. That's all I'm going to talk about today. I hope this video has been useful. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please like the video if you've enjoyed it. Please feel free to comment if you've got any questions or suggestions, um, any criticisms, feedback, please I welcome you to share those with me. It really helps to enrich um, this process of sharing information and gives me some ideas on how I can support everyone going forward. We just heard the train in the background. <laughs> That's okay. We'll just roll with that for today. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care.